All right, so uh, we're going to be talking about um, an artifact knowledge graph that we built out and we're calling Guac. Uh, just a couple, a little introduction to myself. Um, so I'm uh, Mike Lieberman. I'm a CTO and co-founder of Kusari, a supply chain security startup. And I do a lot of work with the CNCF. I'm a security tag lead. I helped uh, co-lead the um, CNCF Secure Software Factory Reference Architecture, as well as a maintainer on uh, Fresca and OpenSSF project. And uh, I am Mihai. I, was, I joined Google four years ago to work on TensorFlow security. And uh, this year, I joined the Google Open Source Security team and started working on Guac and other projects right there. Um, so we first want to just shout out that uh, this tool that we're going to be showing off is an industry collaboration. Um, you know, it, it started off as a, a collaboration uh, between Google, Kusari, uh, Purdue University, and Citi. All right. So what's the problem, right? What's the problem here uh, that we're trying to solve? Well, you know, um, there's all this stuff that's happening in your software supply chain, right? You know, you keep hearing about, hey, I need, I need to be generating salsa, I need to be consuming salsa, I need to be generating SBOMs, I need to be making sure that everybody else has SBOMs, I need to be analyzing those SBOMs and all that great stuff, right? But one of the big problems that people keep bringing up is, okay, well, how do I know if something has an SBOM? How do I know if it's been consumed already by, you know, this stuff? Where do I, you know, if, if there is an SBOM out there, where should I be looking for it, right? Um, some of these things are stored in stuff like SigStore's ReCore. Some of this stuff is stored in, you know, REST APIs, uh, random buckets, uh, in OCI, um, and all that sort of stuff. And usually when you even pull down a package, you know, you might be pulling down a salsa attestation for that particular package, but what about its dependencies? You're not pulling information down there. And like this is similar to some of the stuff we saw with, for example, log4j, where it, it was um, the compromised versions of log4j were really deep in your supply chain, right? Where you thought, no, I'm not using log4j, but it turns out you're relying on some library which relies on some library which relies on some library that does use a compromised uh, version of that. And so once you kind of go two or three layers in, as you can kind of see there in the red, it's like, I don't know. Am I pulling stuff in? Does it exist? I have no idea. Okay, so now let's talk about where this tool that we're going to be talking about fits. So um, these are sort of the, the layers of uh, supply chain security. Right. First, you know, you want to kind of say you want to have a trust foundation, right? You want to have stuff like SigStore, where you're saying I'm making sure that uh, stuff gets signed, that you know these are the rules around what identities I trust, and 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 uh, stuff like you know secure timestamping, all that good stuff, right? And once you have that sort of foundation, then you want to start attesting to the things you are building, right? And um, you want to also be able to consume those attestations, right? So that's stuff like SBOM, Salsa attestations, VEX, all sorts of other in toto uh, attestations as well. And so then we have sort of uh, aggregation and synthesis, right? You want to be able to then consume all that data, analyze it, make, uh, you know, be able to then go into the next piece, which is like you want to fi figure out insight and then generate policy that can make decisions based on that data that you've aggregated and synthesized. And so Guac fits in on that green box there for uh, aggregation and synthesis. So, okay, so what exactly is Guac, right? So Guac, uh, it's a backronym for Graph for Understanding Artifact Composition. Naming is hard. Uh, but it is a knowledge graph of software metadata to answer security and supply chain questions, right? So the idea here is, as I mentioned previously, right, you have all this data how do I actually ingest it and start asking like broader questions about the problem? So let's talk a little bit about how it works. So at a very high level, we're consuming all sorts of records from stuff like SigStore and that are stored in things like ReCore or OCI or buckets or, you know, whatever. Um, we're ingesting, you know, various things from, um, you know, SBOMs that are generated by various tools. We're ingesting uh, vulnerability data from various streams. 
we're then correlating all that information and putting it into a, uh, you know, putting it into something that can then be queried by uh, users. And now, what does this look like, right? So a few uh, slides ago, I showed you, you know, what was implicitly there in your supply chain, right? There are all these artifacts, and there might be some documents here and there, and it's not very clear where all that stuff lives. Um, but what Guac allows us to do is Guac allows us to actually build out a graph with those relationships so that we know, you know, this SBOM was, you know, we, we have records inside of a database of, hey, this identity didn't just sign this SBOM, but it also uh, signed this Salsa attestation because we ingested all of those documents. We also now have a bunch of additional metadata about the actual artifacts and not just about the, um, about a bunch of additional artifacts, we are including stuff like VEX and who might have signed off on that VEX. Um, and we plan to sort of also include all sorts of other uh, metadata as well, right? And so it's a record of those ingested documents. We also then sort of parse those ingested documents, allowing us to then generate um, uh, the relationships between them, you know, a, a graph uh, that allows us to sort of um, make it easier to sort of query about information about what depends on what, who attested to what actual, um, uh, what, what actual piece of information. We also plan to sort of include sort of temporal data like assertions on vulnerability scans. So, you know, one of the big things is like, hey, yeah, I, we, we scanned that artifact. Yeah, you scanned it, you know, a year ago, but have you scanned it since then? And as it turns out, there's either been new heuristics or new data uh, feeds that have come in that would have shown that actually, yeah, it wasn't vulnerable a year ago, known by you know, certain scans, but since then, it would have been detected as vulnerable. And then we also plan to have all of this sort of stuff be a data source that you could then use for policy to then make decisions on stuff like, how does this get it gated into production and all that good stuff. Now, uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Mihai to sort of show you what this looks like currently. So uh, we have a local instance of Guac that we ingested several documents and we have several nodes already in the Neo4j database. We are going to use the Neo4j graphical interface for queries at the moment, but we plan in the future to actually create uh, APIs so that would give you GraphQL results instead of opening the Neo4j interface. So right now I will type Neo4j queries in here to just see what we ingested from SALSA attestations and SPDX and so on. But in the next release, in the future release, we'll have uh, proper queries. Okay, so for this one, we have uh, in our graph, we have artifacts nodes, we have package nodes. Uh, this one is uh, scorecards, so it, it's, 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 an attest, it's an attestation, sorry, scorecards, I think is this one, the metadata. And this one is the builder, so like when you are using Salsa, it's the Salsa builder and so on. And there are all, all of the relationship in them. All of this is detected based on what we parse in the document. So if we parse a Salsa, doc, doc, if, if we parse a Salsa attestation, we detect that there is this builder node. So we create a builder node type, there is this artifact and so on. So everything is created based on the documents that we ingest. Okay, and let's see what we have in here. So first thing, just a simple uh, GraphQL query to see how many nodes we have. Uh, so we ingested around 70 documents and in total we have 8,000 nodes out of all of these uh, types that we saw before. And now we can go and explore what we have here. I'm not gonna type the queries again. So let's try first to explore a Kubernetes cluster. So if I, uh, actually, let me begin with a simple package node and return just that one. And because I don't want to return all of them, I will return just 10. So the GraphQL interface here offers multiple options to look at the results. One is as a table or the JSONs and the other one is as a graph. Uh, we'll probably use the graph uh, representation most of the time because it's easier for visualization, but in some cases the table one would be better suited. So for these 10 nodes that we limited, we have uh, all of the attributes. So if I click on the node, I have all of the attributes on the right and I can then query on them. And one that is important is the Perl, which is the package URL, so that, that I can use later to to zoom into just one of the nodes. 
And then there is these tags that we have so, to, so that we can identify which are binaries artifacts, which are container, Docker container artifacts, and so on. So now let's look, let's explore a Kubernetes container. Uh, I am expanding this query. So I'm taking a package where the Perl contains Kubernetes controllers manager, and I'm returning that node, so it should be I think I deleted something. Yeah, I deleted one dash here. Okay, so this one has several nodes, and I can zoom all of them into the graph. We will pick one of these versions, so let's say, if I look at them, each one of them has a different version. So this is 124.4, 124.5, and so on. We can pick uh, 124.6, and now we'll have just one single node. And now we want to ask queries about this one. So one way we can ask queries is select the node and expand all of the relationships, but this definitely <laughs> doesn't work because there are so many dependencies on this project, on this uh, container. Another one is to actually run the queries ourselves. So I will copy this one where I'm going to just focus on relationships of type depends on or contains, so a container depending on another one or an artifact depending on another one, between one and five hops and returning all of these paths. This is still gonna be large. And now I can limit this. I want the artifact tags to be binary. So I can continue this. And now I have something that I can look at. So I have this package that is a Cube Controller Manager, and it has two dependencies. One of them is the Cube Scheduler. Uh, sorry, one of them is the Go Runner. I look at the name, so one, that's one binary. And the other one is the Cube Controller Manager. And now I want to see which of these binaries has attestations on them. So what I can do, I can expand this query to also look if I have metadata or attestations in them. Let me copy this bigger query. Okay. So now out of all of those nodes, I can also rotate them around to make them look better. So I have this attestation that refers to this uh, node, uh, if I scroll to the name, to the Cube Controller Manager. But this other dependency, that was the Go Runner, doesn't have any attestation in this container. So some policies that would say, I only trust stuff that has attestations, would flag this uh, container, would say, this doesn't follow the policy, reject it. Okay, the next uh, thing we can ask is to look at the Docker container. So I can look at packages that are of type container and from Debian. One second. So I have just one single node in this case, in uh, our instance of Guac. And from this one, I want to see what are the dependencies shared with other containers. So I have another larger query here, where I am looking for this Debian node that I have, what are its dependencies, and then what are other packages that also depend on those. And then I order based on the dependencies. So I have several containers that have a lot of shared dependencies in common, like 1500 and so on. But then I also have smaller images that only have one single dependency in common. So with Guac, it's easy to determine which are slim dependencies, which are harder, bigger ones, and so on. And finally, another query that we might want to look is for log4j. Let's see how many packages that we have ingested that depend on log4j. I go back to the graph node. It seems I have only three packages that contain log4j in their name. And I can look to see which containers uh, contain log4j. So I'm gonna take this query. So in my case, I have two artifacts that contain log4j. Uh, one of them is, has been generated from SPDX vulnerable. So it's, it's an image that we know has been vulnerable in our document. The other one has been generated from a SPDX statement that says that the image has been fixed. However, if you look at this image, you see that both of them depend on the same log4j packages. So 
the fixing actually didn't contain a fix for log4j, it contained a fix for some other vulnerability. And if I replace this log4j with the Apache commons, so that should be a text common, I think. One second, I'll get to that. Okay, so in this case, I have two containers with each one of them depending on another container that is fixed. So actually the SPDS that was fixed was fixing the Apache container, was not fixing the log4j. So it's very easy with Guac to identify what got fixed, what didn't. You can also write bigger queries to identify what is the plan to fix, uh, what, what dependencies you need to update to, fix, uh, to update after uh, vulnerable dependencies and so on. Uh, back to you. So yeah, just to um, highlight there, we showed a little, a few things off for um, Guac there, and as Mihai mentioned, it was only uh, like 70 or so documents that we had ingested for that specific thing, but we have been testing this out with, you know, ingesting tens of thousands of documents related to, uh, you know, tens of thousands of different artifacts, packages, images, and so on. Um, it's kind of a little hard to demo that just given how uh, big that is right now. Um, but wanted to just sort of show you, you know, we are sort of looking at that and, and seeing a lot of interesting relationships between packages, between artifacts, between um, attestations for those things and, and so on. And then the other you know, nice thing um, that's kind of coming out of some of the things that we're seeing here is, is we found in certain cases like certain, you know, a lack of information about certain artifacts, but then you start to ingest other documents. And then all of a sudden those documents might have some additional information. And, you know, if you, and if you trust that, let's say the person producing that document, then you can kind of ingest that and then immediately you get a much better understanding of your supply chain. All right, so what, what are some of the challenges uh, we're having as we're building this out? So once again, this, this thing here is, is very much pre-alpha at this point. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work on it, but it, it is gonna take a while um, for it to mature. So, uh, but while kind of building this out, well, what are some of the challenges, right? So um, one of the big ones is data quality, right? Uh, so without um, a lot of different attestations from a lot of different sources uh, and good high quality documents, so, you know, it's gonna be hard to sort of, uh, I'd say Guac is gonna be quite empty if a lot of folks are not putting out, you know, you know, they're not signing their containers, if they're not generating SBOMs, if they're not generating Salsa and other sort of in toto attestations and those sorts of things. Another thing we noticed is a lot of document generation doesn't actually follow the specifications. Um, a lot of things that are generating SBOMs generate like 90% to the spec, but that kind of leads to a problem where if two different documents don't generate the correct, uh, let's say, SBOM or the correct Salsa attestation, then it's almost impossible for Guac to ingest it because then we'd have to support, you know, uh, tool A's sort of uh, SPDX implementation or whatever. And that's kind of very, very difficult. So that's one big, big challenge that we're dealing with right now. Um, another big uh, challenge is actually the quantity of the metadata um, and also the completeness of the metadata. So we're seeing in a lot of documents, you know, a lot of documents, and we get it, right, you know, this stuff is still relatively new, relatively nascent, um, but for a lot of folks, you know, uh, they're including the bare minimum in the Salsa attestation or the bare minimum in, the, uh, in their SBOM, and the less data that's there, the less valuable it is overall. And generally, you know, just given how new a lot of this stuff is, is that, you know, there's some documents that are starting to, uh, sorry, there are some artifacts and packages that are generating attestations and SBOMs and all that good stuff, but, but that needs to increase drastically um, because uh, without that, then, you know, there's not gonna be a lot of data to then use to analyze your supply chain. Um, another big issue is also sort of interoperability, and this is something that, you know, we, we noticed uh, is there's lots of different software identifiers, right? And that also includes different hash algorithms. 
So if one document refers to a hash by SHA-256 and another document refers to that same artifact but using SHA-1, it's not going to line up unless you have some understanding of, yeah, actually that, was, that is the same literal thing. And that kind of, you know, obviously causes a lot of challenges there. And then also with stuff like, you know, Perl, right, uh, stuff like the hash is optional in Perl. And so there's also a lot of stuff of, hey, these two things are claiming to have be the same package, but are they actually the same package? It can be very um, difficult uh, to figure out. And then also, um, obviously, scalability, right? The ecosystem is very large, and you know, we're looking to see how can we make it easy to ingest lots of different artifacts, especially in that open source space. You know, what, what are the ones that make the most sense? And how do we make sure that you know, um, if we begin to ingest hundreds of thousands of artifacts, this whole thing doesn't fall over? So uh, now we can talk about a little bit about the next steps, right? So for us, the big thing for us is we really want to work with the community more, right? We want to ingest a lot more document and metadata types, uh, as well as other sorts of interesting metadata. Um, so this is stuff like VEX documents, right? We want to be able to ingest those VEX documents. I'd be able to attach it to like claims of a uh, vulnerability that is attached to a um, particular artifact so that you can then go back and say, okay, great, I know, you know, I can go in, uh, as opposed to needing to go out uh, to some sort of VEX, you know, uh, figure out where that VEX lives, you can sort of query something like Guac to see if um, there is a VEX for that. We're also looking to integrate with sort of vulnerability streams like OSV and all those sorts of things to sort of uh, figure out, you know, um, uh, to, to pull in additional information. Um, at, at a given time. We're also looking to sort of integrate with some other stuff like Gitbomb and Gitoid so that we can uh, have, you know, um, the Git object ID is a pretty useful sort of software identifier and so we're looking to sort of integrate with that. We also want to help harden existing types. So we want to work with the community in, you know, on, on Salsa and uh, I'm a steering committee member of Salsa, but, um, and, you know, we also have a bunch of folks who are maintainers on some of the SB, uh, SBOM uh, specifications as well. We're looking to kind of figure out, like, what can we do to make it easier to make sure that all of these identifiers can help, you know, we can it, have that interoperability between them. Uh, yeah, and along those lines, yeah, we want to rally around those software identifiers and make sure that there's some way, even if it, there's mappings or something that between them, we want to see if there's ways we can kind of make that easier. We also want to create a lot of new uh, relationship types like certification. So like, hey, did an organization or an auditor actually certify this particular application um, and, or this particular package? Uh, we want to also be able to you know, pull in stuff like build inputs, where the, whether it's like a build info file or information from a Salsa SBOM. We want to say for like open source code, okay, this is how it was claimed to have been built. And then you would be able to then pull that information out of Guac and potentially run that build yourself. And some um, short-term goals for us, or short to medium-term uh, goals for us, are one is we want to do uh, a, and sponsored by Google, a public service for querying a subset of open source packages. So the idea would be this would run as a public service similar to something like a SIG store. Um, and you'd be able, we'd ingest, you know, not every open source package because that's just not, not going to work. But we can ingest a lot of the top open source packages. Um, and related information about them into a public service that can then be queried. Um, obviously with some level of restrictions and so on, because you know, without rate limits, uh, <laughs> that'll, that'll fall over. Uh, and another thing is we're looking to create, you know, and we're not taking the name chips, we're just like it's cute for this uh, presentation, but um, we, we have a little <laughs> set of um, little utilities and tool plugins that we plan to build for stuff like VS Code and plugins for the package managers that can then be used to then query Guac about some of that information and either give warnings or also be used in conjunction with policy to say, oh, wait, we actually discovered all of this really weird information inside of Guac. Maybe you don't want to install that. And to just give a very, very quick, uh, here's a screenshot of um, something that's still very much under heavy development. But it's like, hey, we have an SBOM and 
in that SBOM, we could actually go in, it parses that SBOM, and then you can click in, and it'll automatically query into Guac for additional information. And we plan to do the same for stuff like requirements.txt files, go mod files, and so on, where you'll be able to then just be able to see, okay, this is all the packages we discovered. We can click in there. We can go and then look at uh, all the stuff uh, we, we can then go and look at, you know, if there's any interesting information, if there's any known vulnerabilities, if it matches the local policy or whatever. And finally, um, a call to action, right? Uh, so we're on GitHub, um, you know, uh, github.com slash guac slash guac. You could also just uh, take a snapshot of the QR code. Um, there is, uh, we have listed here, you know, there's not many contributors yet, only, uh, I believe, 11 or so, and we want, obviously, more contributors to the project. And just a couple of calls out to some prior art. Um, a lot of this reflections on trusting trust. Uh, Jacques Chester had a really good article on requirements for a universal asset graph, and then also a lot of the graph pieces were inspired by uh, Nix and NixOS. Uh, now opening up for uh, questions. Oh, it's oh oh yes, this one. Sorry. <laughs> so so we also have chips and guac that we'll give to the first five people that ask questions. <laughs> Um, obviously, the supply chain is not in Guac, so it's not tested. <laughs> no, I guess. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, thanks for this talk. Uh, I was just wondering, so what is Guac, actually? So, is it, a, a, I saw it's a concept, it's a schema, it's, maybe it's a, it's a bunch of ingestion tools to build up the graph. You said it's pre-alpha. There, there's planned to be a service uh, that you can query. So, what what is Guac? Is it the idea of using a graph to query it? Will it be the database that you build up centrally? So, what's your vision for this? Yeah. So it'll be um, a, so primarily it'll be the database, but the APIs that are also wrap around that database, and then you know Google plans to run it as a public service as well. Um, uh, and so, so that's like part of that, but the same way that, you know, um, for something like SigStore, you could run your own Fulcio if you wanted to and whatever, you could run your own Guac. And we sort of expect that like folks who, you know, you're not going to be ingesting your private, uh, you know, software into the public Guac, um, as well as there might be a bunch of extra data that you want to pull in that the public service might not be ingesting. And so that's really what it is. And then it would be essentially just the APIs that make it very easy to both ingest documents as well as uh, query it. So I could run it my own and maybe import your pre-built yep. database dump and then uh, expand it with my personal or exactly. my internal data. Yeah, cool. so we have a plan for the future to be able to query the public instance. You set some starting points, like I'm interested about this package, this package, this package. You get the entire subgraph generated from those and you can import it into your, your, your own instance from the same API. <laughs> All right, so th this is a really interesting talk and I think this is uh, really needed in the space. Um, I, uh, there's a couple of problems that you have when you have things that have sort of rich schemas and description types. Um, there's the advantage of having a schema where you, a tool like Walk understands what a lot of the SBOM metadata means. Um, but there's also a problem that, uh, you know, the example you had, you pointed out with the SHA hashes, think of a slightly different example where one person representing SHA-256, like a 256 SHA hash writes SHA-2, another person writes SHA-256, another person says SHA-2-256 bits. Um, have you seen or heard of any kind of normalization of schemas in this space that would make your life easier? Uh, so we have a little bit of normalization inside uh, the parser uh, part of the guac, but uh, we will still need to normalize to handle multiple cases and so on. So it's still work in progress. 
Yeah, and I believe there's some effort from like the Intoto side on what's being called sort of a predicate dictionary that could hopefully help out with a little bit of that. But a lot of it, I think, is also a lot of work needs to be done in the community space to help sort of build that unified data model. I was actually in a conversation uh, yesterday with some folks from Docker who were saying exactly the same thing, is that, hey, it's great that there's all these specifications, all these schemas, but without sort of having some way to help standardize the data model a little bit, then you end up with a situation where it's really difficult to know, even when like you call it name and other, another person just says package, but it, they're both the name of the package. Yeah, it, it becomes a mess. <laughs> I, I think also there's some efforts on the package URL community to try and standardize that a little bit. Uh, I think this is still work in progress, but I think that's, that's the, the hope there to be like a universal identifier. Um, I know you just did, so I'll get you a quote later. Hey, um, great talk, thanks. Um, it, what is the query language, either now or, or in the future, plans for around the query language? And then also, is that is it something that can be like uh, scriptable? I'm imagining, for example, having a job in a CI pipeline that um, is going to use API calls to guac and and make um, make decisions based on that. Is that something that's in the in the roadmap? Yeah. So um, the plan is probably something like GraphQL uh, for um, that sort of front facing uh, end user stuff. Um, we do plan to make it flexible, especially for folks who are running it internally. Right. As a public service, we'll probably have to restrict what type of queries can get run because we don't want queries that are just so enormous uh, that that'll kill the, the service. But I think for, for that, and we, I think we plan to make it flexible. I think, do you have any more? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the talk. It's a, a, a agreed, much needed. Have you considered using uh, ontologies or you know things like Shackle, the shapes language, to kind of help with some of the, you know, instead of normalizing to one schema for all things, kind of building up an ontological understanding of what the meaning of these things are and what other names they could be uh, referred to by. It seems like we could take some, some things from the, um, the semantic web work that's been happening over the last good long while. <laughs> so I can take a little bit of that. Uh, that if we use the ontologies directly, then we'll have too many edges between uh, nodes and that would overcomplicate complicate the query part because then the answering the queries will become too much, too slower, too much slow. So it's better to encode the ontology representation inside the parser. So when we parse a document, we encode the extra information like this, are, this shot on 256 and shot two, they mean the same thing. So we are always mapping them to the same metadata. And I think also a big challenge uh, that, that we are looking to do, which is part of that sort of predicate dictionary as well as some of the other things, is we're trying to also figure out ways to make sure that we can ingest new document types that still match that data model, even like so that we don't have to recompile um, <laughs> you know, the, the guac code and the API every single time. We could have a way of saying, oh, yeah, we pull down some sort of schema that has that sort of ontological mapping to what internally happens inside of guac. Yeah, that, that's something that we're, we're, we're very interested in, in doing. All right. We have time for one more question. Anyone on this side of the room? I have a great question. All right. <laughs> Why did you name it something we can't actually find on Google? Because <laughs> <laughs> you can eat it. <laughs> yeah. Um, naming's hard. <laughs> Oh, also, uh, there's T-shirts in the back. Uh, please, please take. <laughs> also, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to tap me on the shoulder. Same. <laughs> All right, thank you so much.